Today, our webinar is going to be 30 minutes along with time at the end for Q&A. During the webinar, you can send your question, questions through the chat icon at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer your questions during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar today. We will be issuing PDH certificates for those attending the live session that have elected to receive them. A copy of the presentation will also be include, included post-webinar. All of our webinars are available on demand at BartlettWest.com and we will continue to add webinars in the future. So check our website out on a consistent basis and get registered for any upcoming opportunities. Today we will hear from Jim Ross. After working eight years as the city engineer and public works director, Jim Ross now serves as Bartlett and West's go-to expert on utility projects. He brings a unique perspective from designer, contractor, and utility director. And he's always looking at the long-term impact to communities who must live with a final project. Today, he will be discussing AWIA Water Resilience Compliance. Are you prepared? With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim to take it away. Thanks, Rebecca. And thanks for everyone for, for joining us today. Hopefully you can find uh, some value in the information um, we're talking about today, or maybe get a few questions answered. So what is, all right, so let me try this one more time. Able to see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen, Jim. All right. All right, here we go. So quick overview. AWIA, if you don't know what that means, American Water Infrastructure Act of 2018. And <clears throat> Say when I first saw it, I said, okay, well, we've already done vulnerability assessments that were required previously, and we've already done emergency response plans previously required, so why is this different? Um, well, it replaces the uh, Section 1433 of the, the Drinking Water Act. You know, in 2002, uh, related to, you know, 911 and other things that had happened, there was a requirement for vulnerability assessments. Um, so this kind of takes the place of that and um, provides a, a little more depth and a little more meat and potatoes around uh, our planning. And it applies to all water systems serving more than 3,300 people. So a few of the new things that AWIA requires, um, relevant acts, uh, you know, those that uh, we, we don't really think of on a day-to-day -day basis, but uh, there are some crazy people out there these days, so we, we need to prepare for some of those situations. Um, cybersecurity, another one that, you know, 20 years ago uh, wasn't such a big thing. It, it was there, but uh, it's definitely much more risky today. And then we all deal with natural disasters, so uh, that's another category we're going to look at. So a quick overview of the requirements. Um, EPA requires this, I'll call it the RRA conduct a risk and resiliency assessment. Um, so that you understand what your risks are and how you can prepare for those. And then you update your emergency response plan, the ERP, um, as a way of addressing those risks and vulnerabilities that you've identified in the assessment. Now you don't submit your entire report to EPA. Uh, you keep that as your document, but there's a certification letter that is required to be submitted. And uh, so that has to be submitted for your assessment and also for your emergency response plan. And then you are to update those every five years. Uh, one of the other things, and other, you know, we talk about natural disasters, you do coordinate with local emergency uh, planning groups and others. Uh, this takes that a little bit deeper as well as additional requirements for documenting and maintaining records. So what does the framework of this look like? And I'm sure we've all seen different versions of vulnerability assessments, risk assessments, triple bottom line, asset management, they all kind of encompass the same thought process that we identify our assets. Um, so that's the, the first step, assess. Uh, what's the condition of those? Uh, we plan for how to improve them, how to mitigate risks, how to take care of emergencies. 
uh, develop the emergency response plan, train our staff of what the, all that looks like. Um, lo and behold, uh, we, we like to plan and not have to use it, but uh, then we respond when the situation happens. And then hopefully we recover quickly and don't have the loss of your water system for any sustained length of time. So that's kind of how the, the framework works. So understanding a little bit about you. So just to understand who we have on the call today, got a quick uh, poll question for you. If you would answer it, appreciate it. Uh, so what size of water system do you represent? Uh, different categories there. If you're from a competing consultant, then you, you need to just give it off the phone. No, um, jokingly there, but if that doesn't apply to you, there's a, a non applicable button as well. All right, so looks like we have the majority in the 10,000 to 30,000 users have some in other categories as well. So I appreciate you answering the question there and it gives us a sense of, of what the audience is. So, all right, our agenda today, we're gonna go over the purpose and requirements um, and go a little deeper than we did just a minute ago. Uh, what's the schedule for compliance? What some action steps are and a few lessons learned from um, past projects. So the purpose, I think we're all, we're all here for, you know, protect the life and health of all citizens. I'm um, protecting our water quality, which is becoming a, a, a bigger challenge these days. And, you know, EPA says we need to prepare for all hazards. And, and, and I guess in that, we don't always have all the resources for every situation but uh, the ones that we do understand and have ability to mitigate, they're, they're asking us to document that. And then you know, that, that provides the ability to, for us to create resiliency. So what does resiliency really mean? Um, according to EPA, the first bullet item there, to maintain and or restore operation during and after an event. So if we've got a um, use an example. We have a, a tornado come through and uh, some of the, the system is non-operable. Um, how do we maintain our ability to provide water during that and uh, afterwards and how, how quickly can we get things restored? So the, the basics of risk management um, and Murphy's Law, all systems fail. Um, maybe not completely, maybe not catastrophically, but there's always, you know, there's always a life cycle. And so we're asked to build it to fail well. That, that's kind of hard for me to say. Um, they're in the smiley face, but uh, expect the unexpected and, um, you know, fail well is a, is a good example of can you, um, mitigate an issue, for example, you've got a secondary feed to your water plant or you've got a secondary source or can you shut some valves off because of a failure and easily uh, convert to a different source. So you know, that, that's a, a way to be resilient because you there was a failure, but you can mitigate it pretty quickly. Uh, resilience is really about overcoming the unexpected all right, some of the requirements. EPA asks us to characterize and identify the most critical assets of the system. And so kind of like the, uh, the link on the chain over there, you know, what, what is our weakest link? Um, a single point of failure. Like I mentioned before, maybe there's only a single water source. Um, in some cases I've seen systems, especially the smaller um, communities where they're kind of uh, out away from uh, the larger cities, they don't have a lot of options for power source. So if you don't have a backup generator, then you're likely you just have one power source. You don't have a duplicate. Uh, in a lot of cases, you've got one transmission main in a section of the system. And so if that fails, that has to be restored immediately or um, your 
out of water for hours or, or maybe longer. And just thinking through you know, what pieces of your system are in that kind of a category where if it is to fail, um, your citizens are out of water or their water quality is at risk. Then identifying your threats. Um, so what's the most critical? You know, we, we all deal with a failure of pipes or equipment because of age condition. Um, but maybe there's a, a damaged pipe or an exposed pipe. I know I found one several years ago that was a, a line that crossed a, a creek. Uh, the creek it used to cover, you know, the, the water main was underneath it um, by several feet. And all of a sudden, all the erosion now it's exposed and it's you know sticking three or four feet in the air, and that was a, a single point of failure that, that could create a, a lot of people being out of water. So simple things like that. Um, sometimes the the tools we use, I'll say, can create issues. So how many of you have a hydraulic locator? say never underestimate the power of a backhoe. Um, so this is how we find water mains. We just have Bob go uh, use the backhoe and he finds them for us. Uh, oh, we've probably all seen that too. But uh, so just identify where, where are your hazards, where are your threats, um, and then begin to look at what kind of consequences they have. Uh, a few examples of single point of failure. Um, 2013, American Airlines ended up canceling 970 flights for honestly a, a very simple computer system issue. If they would have had some redundancy, that would, have, would not have happened. Um, same thing with United Airlines a year earlier. And the, the picture here shows a, a router. You know, sometimes we've got one small item that we don't think a whole lot about that's you know in the back room or in the closet or in the basement or wherever and you know, how much do we truly rely on that if it is to fail uh, what's going to happen and you know is your SCADA system completely down um, you know what's your backup So some of the physical elements um, we've got a couple different categories here that the EPA asked us to the review and assess. Uh, the top right, your water source. You know, what's your risk of contamination? Um, you know, is it protected? Is the water quality protected? Your conveyance system, your distribution system. You know, what what's your your risks there, and how do you uh, manage that going forward? Uh, your storage tanks. Now, Hopefully you don't have the situation like the picture in the center there and a water tower falling over. And I will say that that one wasn't an accident. It was done purposely, but it, you know, there's been a few I've seen that have uh, had some foundation issues or some corrosion issues that, that weren't addressed. And, you know, that can be pretty catastrophic for a system. Uh, obviously our treatment plan is the backbone of everything. So maintaining it appropriately um, in identifying where those risks are in, in regards to, you know, I, I go back to contamination, that, that's one that um, comes up quickly, but maybe that's simply an algae bloom or um, a, a piece of equipment that fails and you have no redundancy, so that, that impacts your water quality. And then same thing with your monitoring system, and not just your SCADA, but other ways that you monitor as far as the security and, and other items. So speaking of security, uh, cyber has been a huge issue uh, as of late. Uh, SCADA systems, our processing controls, our enterprise system, you know, our, our networks, maybe you're connected to City Hall or uh, your water district and how all that uh, integrates. And, and even, you know, we control a lot of things with cell phones these days and, um, you know, people can hack into those. So we've got to put some protections around each of these items. Um, the Ponemon Institute in 2016 did a data breach study, the root causes of data breaches. And this one is 
I, I guess not surprising, but it is kind of alarming. Almost 50% was based on malicious or criminal attacks to the system. You know, we always have human error and, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of copying and pasting something in a wrong folder or, you know, fat fingering something and uh, messing up and calling the IT and say, hey, I, you know, here's what happened, fix it for me. But, um, you know, it's pretty scary that half of those are on purpose. A few examples of that, you know, attempted cyber attack highlights vulnerability of global water infrastructure. You know, that's an article that was in the Wall Street Journal uh, front page, so that, that's pretty serious. Uh, AWWA in 2019 says cyber risk is a top threat uh, and cybersecurity is a top priority. Uh, so a, a few other statistics here. In 2020, some, some big noted cyber attacks that have happened just in the last few months. A large system in South Carolina was impacted. Uh, another one in Colorado and uh, Detroit, Michigan. Um, so it, it's there and things happen and we've got to plan ways to uh, reduce that risk and mitigate that. So in 2015, the Department of Homeland Security, of all of the investigations they did regarding cyber attacks, they found that um, the fourth largest sector uh, of all sectors was the water systems. So that's a scary one too. I uh, wouldn't think that would be a focus, but you know, we have billing systems and we have credit card data and you know, we're, we're probably not as in tune with all of that as maybe a credit card company would. So other items are human elements, you know, who comes into your system or who, works on your system you know we've got obviously we've got employees um, but you know there's contractors there's crazy engineers there's labs and security people there's other stakeholders and so thinking about what, what access do they have um, can they do something accidentally or on purpose and you know we all screw up and kind of like Homer Simpson here you know um, the picture on the, the top right there is like you know contractor, engineer, owner, they're all scratching their head. So somebody really screwed up and hopefully it's not finger pointing at like the bottom there. Um, we've got to work together and hopefully we're, we're not the, the single focus of blame. So thinking about threats and vulnerability, EPA asks us to look at what those highest and most significant risks are. Um, so the picture on the bottom there on the left, um, nice guy, he's doing his job, things are going well, and all of a sudden he flips and on the right, he's now he's the devil and um, he's putting bugs in the system. And I, I don't say that lightly, because I've, I've seen it personally happen when, uh, you know, somebody's let go or, you know, situations change um, within their personal life and, and, and things happen. And so we need to be prepared for that. And maybe as simple as, you know, the, they don't have access any longer to uh, your network or, you know, if somebody that's been gone for a year or two and you don't think anything about it, you know, do, do they really still have access to any information. Um, so some simple things like that can make a difference. And then, Obviously, there's um, a whole lot more detail that goes into, you know, existing employees, and we won't get into that right now, but, uh, but be thinking that way. And then EPA asks us to identify what those consequences are. So, obviously, we, we don't want to impact someone's life or their health. You know, any incident that we have is going to impact the budget and that you know, the, the best way we can do that is to, you know, manage that efficiently. Um, but like the picture here on the left, uh, you know, the, the boy had an accident, he broke his leg. There's consequences uh, to his health, uh, to his budget, uh, to his car, or maybe to someone else's car. Um, hopefully not someone's life, but, uh, you know, we all have consequences to whatever those actions are, whether it's purposeful or accidental or it's a, you know, a natural hazard. 
So the requirements CPA have, have put out here, the, the categories that we're to evaluate include natural disasters, as we've talked, um, purposeful acts against us, our monitoring practice, and also the financial infrastructure. So a lot of systems struggle you know, to get maybe communicated to city council or board of directors and there's uh, some disconnect there and you know i've seen that as well it's it's difficult when we're trying to operate and maintain a system properly and we don't have the funding to do it appropriately so the purpose of all this is to kind of get people together and work as a team so we think about natural disasters so, you know a hurricane we had one in you know southeast United States here just recently and in the Northwest we've had forest fires and in the Midwest we've had flooding and you know I'm from Missouri being in the Midwest tornadoes are are always a possibility so um, you know some places know exactly how to identify risks and understand what they have to do in regards to an earthquake that would be a change for me I've not been through that one but you know, how we typically are, I would say, more practiced and more trained on the natural disasters than we are like a cybersecurity attack. Um, natural disasters here, this is from 1980 to 2019, the billion dollar disaster events. Uh, that's some big numbers. And you can see by the chart, not only are they getting more expensive, but they're getting more frequent. So another reason why EPA is putting this requirement out there so we can protect our uh, infrastructure. The Melvin acts, you know, I hate to say that the, these are reality, but it, it is in the world we live in today. So how do we deal with the contamination? You know, if, is it a, a purposeful contamination like the, the guy on the bottom of the screen there dumping solvent directly into a drain? that leads to our water source. Um, maybe it's the absent-minded professor down the street or he's you know, doing something in his chemical lab and um, you know that gets dumped down the, the drain. Um, we've dealt with some terrorism in the past and that, that's still on, on the list to uh, be prepared for. Or vandalism or theft, maybe that that doesn't always, in my mind, personally, my personal experience doesn't seem like that's such a huge issue, but I will say at the same time, when copper prices were really high, we had a very large pump station that someone came in over a weekend in the middle of the night and literally removed all of the wiring for the pumps. Um, so that wouldn't have been something that was on the top of my list to think of as a, a threat but uh, definitely have seen it in a, a couple of instances. Uh, another one I probably wouldn't think of a lot, uh, assault by a vehicle or boat or aircraft or even firearms, but again, some of those could be on, on purpose or some of them may be related to, uh, you know, an example, a transformer that powered a, a water system um, was a little too close to an intersection and if an accident was big enough, sometimes it would take out the transformer. So a simple moving the transformer to a different location took care of, of that. But until that happened, uh, there was risk every, every day for an accident to take out power. Then we think about our monitoring practices. You know, we, we all think of, okay, a SCADA system, I've got sensors and meters and all kinds of equipment that help me identify water quality and chemical usage and dosage and all those kind of things. But at the same time, what do we have monitoring our cybersecurity or even our fencing, our gates and doors? You know, do you have a, I'll say I'm guilty as a utility director when I worked at a water plant. The gate was open all day, the doors were unlocked all day you know, we, we didn't think about it, you know, I never had any issues, but it only takes once. Um, and then how are you doing with training in regards to that? Do you, 
training your staff, not only in the, the cybersecurity side, um, but is it video surveillance or do you have, you know, automatic locks or sensors on your doors or gates? And then we go to the financial infrastructure. Now, let's take some communication with stakeholders. Obviously, uh, we can't all budget for every emergency and there are emergency management um, infrastructure out there, you know, FEMA, SEMA, there's lots of other avenues that we can be assisted financially in a devastating disaster. But the smaller ones we've got to plan for and budget for. So we go back to our CIP planning and communicating with all of our stakeholders. All right, question number two, has any of you ever experienced a cyber attack or a security breach? I don't have any background music for you and I couldn't get Rebecca to sing for you. So I guess it, uh, it'll, you just have to listen to me. <clears throat> well, that's good. Most of you have not experienced a security breach or cyber attack. Um, but if you have, it, sometimes it's not so easy to overcome and it, it takes some effort and understanding and help. And, all right, so let's move on to requirements. So deadlines for submitting your risk and resiliency assessment. If your population is over 100,000, yours was due back in March. Um, if you haven't done one, uh, we, we'd be glad to help. Uh, if your population between 50,000 and 100,000, then you have till the end of the year this year. And then the last category from 3,300 up to 50,000, Yours is due June 30th of next year. Now, what that is, you do your assessment uh, and then your certification letter to EPA is what you submit. And then you keep your uh, assessment in, the, in that document on file, both electronically and in, in hard copy. Um, then certification deadline for your emergency response plan is six months after that. So go back to this. For example, if you're in the, the smaller category, yours is due June 30th, and then um, your emergency response plan is, is due basically at the end of the year. Who can certify? Uh, EPA says once your assessment is completed, your director or other leader of the utility uh, must send a signed and certified letter to EPA saying that you have done your assessment. And then again, six months later, a similar letter saying that you've um, prepared your ERP. All right, last question. Have you sustained a natural disaster in the past 10 years? You know, I can say I've seen more floods in the Midwest in the last 10 years than I've seen probably in the rest of my life. A hurricane, tornado, flood, drought, other. I don't always think of a drought as a natural disaster, but when we've seen some water systems that have had complete loss of supply for weeks at a time. It looks like several have seen a, a flood and a few tornadoes, but uh, gladly most of you haven't had to go through a natural disaster recently. All right. So a quick example of what some of this might look like. I'm gonna go through a, a scenario with a water main break and just, just kind of thought provoking here. I think of a water main break, okay, you send people out, you know, you repair the pipe. Uh, well, I guess first you do some communication with others um, to make it safe. Shut some valves down, repair the pipe, fix the road. Okay, done, on to the next one. Sometimes it's not that easy. So in the case of the, the picture here, you can't see on the left side of the, the picture, but there's a, a house that is being completely flooded. So 
immediately, what, what are the consequences that you think about in this situation? Um, a few blocks away, there's a high school. And so school is closed. So that's a consequence of, of this failure. Uh, one that I would not have normally thought of, but uh, definitely sensitive now, because we personally worked on this, uh, North Kansas City Hospital is out of water. So there, there wasn't a secondary feed into the hospital at that time. So that, that's pretty risky. I would not want to be the person that was being um, in surgery at the time that the water got shut off. Uh, another thing that may, maybe doesn't come into play in, in a lot of situations, but here we've got a flooded intersection that, you know, this was a large water main and flooded an intersection downstream pretty rapidly. And then we all see things like this on the news and hopefully we don't ever have to experience it, but you got one leaking for a very long time and, and, and don't recognize it. It can definitely create the catastrophic events of, as far as someone's car or even their life is concerned. So thinking about this, um, so just a, I'll say a simple water main break. What are the impacts and consequences? Well, the school, obviously the staff was impacted, the kids got sent home and parents are off work and lose income. Okay, and I'm sure we get those phone calls and people are frustrated and they can't drive down their block because you got the road shut off. And then businesses lose revenue and um, you know we, we shut off traffic to make the repair safe. Residents lose water availability uh, for a, a period of time and sometimes even uh, at risk for water quality. And the, the home there that was in the example was definitely getting flooded. So it impacts the hospital, dialysis machines, surgeries get canceled, you know, potentially someone losing their life because of that and definitely loss of revenue. And on the transportation side, there could be accidents, drowning, flooding. So can't say that I would always think of all these pieces uh, in regards to a consequence of the water main break, but it, it can really happen. So the steps for the action plan EPA put together, number one, identify your critical assets, which we've talked about, um, assess the risk and the vulnerabilities, then make a plan to minimize those risks and you can't completely eliminate them all. It's just not financially feasible. Um, and then implement your risk management strategy. And lo and behold, if you have to go through an event um, to test your system, evaluate honestly what you've done, how it worked, and if there's some things that can be improved, make some refinements to that. The AWWA J100 standard is one of the tools that can be used for identifying your, your risk and understanding your how you can protect your assets. Um, and as engineers, of course, we always come up with an equation. So um, R equals risk. So you take risk equals your likelihood of a threat times the consequence times the vulnerability. And uh, there is a calculation there and you can go through that assessment there. I think there's a seven step process based on that standard. So that's one example of a tool you can use. There are, there are others provided by EPA or just your standard uh, SWOT analysis. The EPA isn't specifically saying you have to use a specific tool. You just have to go through the assessment and certify that you've done it. So Action step one, defining your critical assets. We talked about no redundancy, single point of failure. So think about uh, how long your system is, is out, uh, out of power, out of water production, out of water treatment, what, what all does all that look like? Um, and what's the direct impact to life and health? Steps two and three, define and minimize risk. So we're defining our vulnerabilities. You know, maybe that's security measures for gates um, or process equipment, cybersecurity, camera sensors, 
and I say proximity principle and kind of in quotes here, but uh, the picture here to the right, the proximity warning, a shock hazard in sometimes telephone poles that carry our power are too close to intersections and uh, can have an impact. So hopefully the, your, your power or others, your equipment are not in proximity to be damaged by uh, typical traffic. And identify your resources and equipment. So you, you plan in your CIP and in your budget to provide redundancy or um, you put emergency process in there or you, you purchase equipment. You know, in, in several cases I've seen where treatment plants seem to always find the, uh, the cheap property at the bottom of the hill, so they're prone to flooding. And in those cases, additional pumps or sandbagging, lots of different ways that uh, they, they can plan um, and, and prepare for different emergencies. And then obviously we implement the plan. And you know, EPA is asking us to look a little further outside the box in some of these. You know, maybe, maybe you don't think of you know, a water main break or a typical uh, event that happens at, at your water plant or in your distribution system and having to engage with a lot of other folks. Um, but think about, you know, on the back of your hand when someone um, blast the fire hydrant or you've got a water main break, you, you know, you're automatically programmed because you've been trained to go to local fire department, police department, the schools. Uh, so you're providing notification pretty quickly. And so in, in these areas, especially with contamination or um, purposeful, you know, uh, events, purposeful actions against the system, Maybe there's chemists that need to be involved, or maybe you have that on staff. But I'll think about the, the availability of local, county, state, uh, even federal assistance. Um, and then just to be able to, to communicate, have workshops and meetings with different stakeholders. And those stakeholders could be local businesses that can, I mean, I've seen this for local businesses that, hey, this is an issue for me. It costs me money. It costs me, you know, business revenue. Therefore, you know, I'll put some money in the game. I'll put some skin in the game to help provide some redundancy. So this doesn't happen all the time. So some public private financing or just having those workshops to coordinate can be greatly beneficial. And then the last step, evaluate and refine. So give yourself credit for where you've done well. You know, identify those successes and you know, make sure people understand what they've done well. And then any process improvements. So what, what was difficult? What didn't go well? How can it be better next time? And EPA is asking us uh, every five years that we update that plan. So the obvious question, a big why, I think we've you've seen all of the the why is built into everything we've talked about, but uh, to kind of reiterate, we're here to benefit the community and these requirements will enhance our coordination with emergency planners, with businesses, with county city managers, with public health officials, and even members of the public. And true benefits, you know, I will say in a lot of cases, city council members didn't truly understand the risk that their staff were having to deal with and you know how they have to I'll call it belt and suspenders or band-aid and duct tape um, when everybody gets involved and understands what they're having to deal with that's going to support your CIP plans a whole lot better uh, also the training so when you're able to train your staff and in the public to assess and mitigate some of these risks. Um, the end result is everyone is improved in their quote unquote risk culture. And there is a little incentive from EPA. Um, $25,000 per day fine. I, I can't say that I know anyone that's been assessed this fine, but it is in the legislation that EPA has that right. So 
that gives me a little incentive to make sure I abide by it. If you're in Missouri, there was a house bill passed in July of this year that applies to all cities less than 30,000. And cyber risk plan was the very first one out of the gate there. So you can see, again, these are standard asset management and risk management type things, but they are being put into law to make sure that we abide by them. So how do we define success? There's probably more people uh, that needs to be involved uh, to define real success. And, and it's all about teamwork. It's definitely uh, the ideas from each different perspective and from your IT people to your operations people to city council members or board members. Um, everybody has a very different perspective. And when we put those together and collaborate, we definitely have a, a better success strategy. And Dr. Jacqueline Conway says definitely we learn from our mistakes and we help bridge the gap. So this this picture here is is one I, I like that uh, sometimes we've got to stand underneath and support each other uh, even when it's difficult. All right. Oh, some lessons learned. Training, communication, training, communication. Uh, that could probably be all of these, but that that is really the essence if we if we don't train our people and communicate with all stakeholders, uh, it doesn't go so well. Um, another physically ask or physically inspect your assets. Now that may sound kind of simple and obvious, but you know I've also seen systems where, yeah, we looked at that a few months ago, no big deal, it was in good shape, and their memory's not exactly the same as the timeline and a few months is what it felt like to them, but it was a few years and it wasn't as in good a shape as they expected. So, you know, don't assume things that, uh, you know, condition of equipment that you haven't really seen or maintained in a, in a long period of time. Um, define and document your mitigation measures. You know, in a lot of cases we have it in our mind um, and we don't like to take the time to document. I'm guilty of that too. But uh, it's very important, especially if, if you're not there tomorrow and something happens, someone else needs to be able to pick that up and be able to take the ball and run with it. Uh, this year's definitely been a lesson with the pandemic. Uh, this has kind of caught a lot of people off guard. You know, will there be another? How, how do we plan for changes in, you know, I'll say I, I know one of my clients the change in water usage was drastic, but the end result balanced out, but their commercial water usage dropped drastically, but their residential water usage increased drastically. So the end result was their revenue didn't change much, um, but the way they operate their system was different. So, you know, think about those types of, of scenarios and Definitely collaboration is the key to success. We, we have to work together as a team. And I'll say some ways that Bartland West has been able to save some effort and money in putting these together is, you know, a lot of you have asset management. Maybe it's not a formal plan, but you, you do have some asset management uh, data that can be used and you have documentation that can be used. So instead of starting from scratch and doing all this uh, blindly, uh, there's a lot of information you already have, you already know that can help to put these plans together pretty efficiently. So correlating all that with existing plans and existing data can definitely help get this checked off your box and uh, get that submitted to EPA and, and move on down the road. With that, I appreciate you taking the time today uh, to listen. Hopefully you Learn something valuable. If not, you got a, a CEU, you can you can put that on your list. Um, and now, Rebecca, I guess we're ready for questions. Yes, at this point, we're going to open it up for Q&A. So if you have any questions, send them through the chat icon. Um, that's at the lower portion of your screen. 
as we wait a couple minutes for questions to come in, I want to thank you again for sharing your time with us today. And thank you, Jim, for sharing your expertise with us. As a reminder, a recording will be available on our website at bartlettwest.com. Um, we encourage you to contact uh, Jim directly. Uh, you can see his contact information there. And I will check out the chat box here. I am not seeing any questions at this time. So again, feel free. If you have questions, you can connect with Jim directly. Um, since I'm not seeing anything at this time, I'm going to wish you all a fabulous day, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. We'll be following up with you with our post-webinar information um, within the next 48 hours. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Thank you again. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, everybody, for attending.